In this video, I'm presenting the insects. Presenting the animals is the exciting part of evolution because now we will see what animals look like and how they behave. In my first video, I said that Darwin's natural selection idea fell apart when Darwin encountered the birds. And this is because birds make loud noises. They have bright colored feathers and even feathers that are a, feathers that are a hindrance to flight. The birds contradicted Darwin's initial idea of survival of the fittest. And it also contradicted the idea that any disadvantage would be rigidly destroyed. Darwin invented the sexual selection idea to cater for the presentation and the behavior of the birds. There was another very important criticism I had made of Darwin's natural selection idea. I had argued that Darwin's idea is simplistic. Life is complex and simple ideas don't reflect the complexity of life. Darwin's idea of evolution concerns survival and nothing else. Darwin did not discuss changes in intelligence or emotional development or social behavior. In fact, Darwin discussed nothing but survival. According to Darwin, animals would accumulate slight successive beneficial modifications over time. If that was truly the case, the later arrivals in evolution would be best at surviving. And this contradicts our observation of the natural world. I had given the example of comparing a kangaroo to a crocodile. This is because marsupials arrived millions of years after the reptiles. Therefore, according to Darwin, kangaroos must have accumulated many more successive slight beneficial modifications. And thus, they must be better at surviving than reptiles. Comparing my first video in which I critiqued Darwin's ideas to my second video in which I explained my model of evolution highlights clear distinctions. In the first video, in which I critique Darwin, the discussion is about animals and what they look like. I explained characteristics or qualities of the male and the female. And I also discuss chromosomes and the chromosomes that they carry. And I showed this graph, on which I had placed all the animal faces over the entire course of evolution on a line. I then explained that over the entire course of evolution, instinct decreases and emotional attachment increases. What I had done in this graph is to explain the trajectory of changing intelligence. What I had actually explained with this graph was that physical expression or physical bodies are secondary in evolution. Intelligence is primary. Evolution is changing intelligence because intelligence changes Physical bodies express the changed intelligence in them. Physical bodies change because they give expression to changing intelligence. From instinctual intelligence to biological intelligence to psychological intelligence. We are a good example of how physical bodies express the changed intelligence in a new organism. The reason why we are a good example is because we look different from the primates. Compare the primate to the boy and the girl on the front cover of my book. A good question is of course, why don't we look the same as the primates but have a different intelligence? The reason why we don't look exactly like the primates and have our intelligence is because that would be impossible. We cannot look like the primates and have an intelligence different than theirs. Because our intelligence is different from that of the primates, our bodies express the intelligence that we have. And that is why we look and behave different than the primates. Intelligence and physical bodies are perfectly in sync with each other. The primates' bodies can perfectly execute the primates' intelligence. Our bodies can perfectly execute our intelligence. We look different from the primates because our intelligence is different. Over the entire course of evolution, intelligence changes 
That is why we see different physical expressions. The process of evolution, as I explained it, is complex and it addresses those crucial issues of fundamental to life, which are changing physical life forms, emotional development and social behavior. And of course, intelligence. The boy and the girl on the front cover of my book, standing on top of the primates, have an intelligence that distinguishes us from the animal world. And that is why our reality is completely different from that of the animals. Keeping in mind that evolution is changing intelligence, and that intelligence changes by reducing instinct and an increasing emotional attachment, I will now address the insects. Insects are the first animals in evolution. Insects have the highest level of instinct or innate survival knowledge. Dominant instinct in the insects is easily observed because insects don't care for their eggs or offspring. Instead, they abandon them. Insects abandon their eggs and their offspring because they do not have to teach their offspring how to survive. Their offspring know how to survive because they have dominant instinct or innate or inborn survival knowledge. Evolution starts with the highest level of instinct. All the animals following the insects have less instinct and have an increased emotional attachment compared to that of the insects. Having a high level of instinct means that the insects have very little self-awareness. Insects respond in accordance to their instinct or inborn or innate survival knowledge. Although there is one continuous process of development and evolution, there are two actors to complete this process. One is the male and the other is the female. The male carries the Y chromosome and he will, through his behavior or because he looks a certain way, carry a greater risk of demise compared to the female. In the insects, this is obvious in many instances. The golden orb spider is a classic example of this male's risk-taking behavior. The male golden orb spider must always run the risk of falling prey to the female when he approaches her to mate. The enormous discrepancy in size between the male and the female is obvious from this video clip. This is the golden orb spider. And the large spider here, that's the female. And this is quite a large web. When you look around in the web, when we come over here, maybe you can see this tiny little spider here. That's one male. Look, and if you go up there, there's another male. And here's another male. And there's another male. That's four, five in total, different males. But if you look at the males and compare them to the female, the males are only maybe four or five mil in size. The female is about eight to ten centimeters in size. And this is, oh, there she goes. Oh, look at her go. I don't know, maybe she caught something. Oh, very tiny little insect she caught. The female can actually grow up to 20 centimeters in size. So this female, although quite a reasonable size, big enough for me, can grow much larger. The thing is that often uh, the, the differences in sizes by naturalists is interpreted as for the male's dwarfism and for the female gigantism. And they're always interpreted from a Darwinian perspective of advantage. You know, it's more beneficial for the male to be small or it's more beneficial for the female to be large. That's of course not what it is. When you understand how I explained evolution, you know how instinct continuously reduces and you understand that insects were the first animals that arrived 450 million years ago. This male, these males have not grown any bigger. They still run the risk now to be eaten every time they mate with her. And that is how evolution is. And it cannot be any different. The male must run the risk. He must risk his life.
Why? That is how he induces the Y chromosome to shed its genes. And what that does, instinct reduces. So the male that risks his life and that fertilizes the female, he passes on the genetic print of less instinct. When there is less instinct, less knowledge of how to do things, the only way we can acquire knowledge is by learning. And we see that in the later stages of evolution, where the youngsters copy and model of the parents. They follow mum and dad around to, and they teach them how to find food. Learning is becoming the dominant feature. But for now, it's very easy to see the differences in size and how these early animals, in this case the spiders, must run, must run the risk to be eaten. And of course they can't do anything about it. This is how life presents and it cannot be any different. Researchers in New South Wales found that the golden orb spider female will kill and devour 33% of the males that approach her. Therefore, the male golden orb spider is running a great risk to reproduce. It is important to realize that the golden orb spider emerged 450 million years ago. The male golden orb spider has obvious injurious deficits. Over 450 million years, the male golden orb spider has not been rigidly destroyed. And what is more, he has not adapted to the environment. The male golden orb spider is, has not grown any larger and st or stronger so that he can mate with the female without a risk to his life. That the male golden orb spider is still as vulnerable as he was 450 million years ago is because it is impossible for him to change and grow, for instance, larger. If the male golden orb spider had grown to a size where he, his life is no longer in greater risk of demise compared to the female, then there is no evolution. Only when the male in each animal phase behave in direct contrast to their innate survival knowledge and show a blatant disregard for their own well-being, instinct reduces and emotional attachment increases. Without the male's risk-taking behavior, there is no evolution. In many nature documentaries, the intelligence of an animal is often questioned. For instance, that of dolphins or that of primates. Questions are often asked whether they are just as smart as us. Many times skull sizes are compared and also an animal's diet and maybe nutrition that causes a spike in intelligence. When we understand the three levels of intelligence and evolution, it gives clarity to an animal's behavior and we won't question differences in behavior. To try to distinguish the intelligence of one insect from that of another is impossible. All the animals in a phase will all behave in a certain manner. <clears throat> For instance, all the insects act or behave in accordance to their dominant innate or inborn survival knowledge. The innate survival knowledge is in, in one insect may be different to that of another. One insect may be a, a carnivore and another a herbivore, but that does not distinguish their level of intelligence. The insect is still responding to their dominant instinct or innate survival knowledge. Whether a dragonfly can accurately predict, estimate or calculate the trajectory of prey is not a sign of independent intelligence, but is simply because of their innate survival knowledge. That the monarch butterfly can navigate thousands of kilometers to all assemble in a patch of forest it's not because of, the, of incredible navigation feats, but because of innate survival knowledge. Therefore, a dragon's fly feat is not smarter than a spider weaving a web or a bee building its hive. These differences are all the expression of instinct or innate survival knowledge. The physical changes in animals is always intelligence congruent. This means that each animal's physical body is perfectly suited or in zinc to the animal's intelligence. For instance, a praying mantis is a carnivore and an incredible hunter. 
The praying mantis does not want to extract nectar from a flower. Neither does a butterfly want to hunt insects. Physical expression, behavior and intelligence are perfectly in sync in each, in each animal. Intelligence changes when instinct reduces and emotional attachment increases. Different physical life forms emerge because the life forms express the change in intelligence. Evolution is changing intelligence expressed or observed in changing physical life forms. It does not matter where you look in life. This process of reducing instinct because of the male's risk-taking behavior never changes. It is always the same. For instance, with regards to the mating behavior of the praying mantis, the female kills 25% of the males during mating. This cannibalistic act is generally interpreted that it is beneficial for the female to eat her partner because of the protein and nutrition this, his body will provide for her offspring. When you realize that inse insects have instinctual intelligence as, and thus dominant instinct, which means that they have the least emotional attachment of any animal, this argument of concern for, for offspring must fail. The female praying mantis kills and sometimes eats her mate because she has absolutely no connection to him and is void or has minimal emotions. The female praying mantis is not evil. She acts in accordance to her innate knowledge. She poses the risk to the male. The male, when he mates with her, runs the risk of being killed. Only the males that mate regardless of the risk and thus have the least self-regard pass on the genetic package of less instinct. And this is how life presents with instinctual intelligence. It is also how evolution progresses to the next phase of less instinct and increased emotional attachment. It is not difficult to see this process of self-sacrifice or having the least self-regard in carnivore cannibalistic insects like the golden of spider and the praying mantis. But how do herbivore male insects such as for instance butterflies show a disregard for their own well-being? The manner in which male butterflies do this is through their color. When you compare butterfly pairs you find that mostly the male is much brighter colored than the female. And this is how the male shows a blatant disregard for their own well-being. The male has brighter colors because by displaying brighter colors, he is easier detected by predators. And thus it is more likely that he will be noticed by predators. And thus is more vulnerable compared to the female who has more camouflage colors. A very good example of how the male butterfly stands out because of his brighter colors is in comparison to the female is the bird wing butterfly. There are varieties of bird wing butterflies but in each of those varieties the male is brighter colored than the female. In the Cairns North Queensland variety the male has iridescent green on his wings as seen as this in this video clip. I am very fortunate to have found a male bird wing butterfly. This male bird wing butterfly has just come out of his cocoon. So he's hanging here drying his wings and waiting for his muscles to strengthen so that he can fly away. So he's in perfect condition. But look how beautifully colored he is. When you compare him to the female, the female is black or dark brown. She's very dull colored. And the difference is that he is easily noticed in the environment and she's more camouflaged. And the reason that he's more easily noticed or brighter colored is not because the male is better, it's because he carries the Y chromosome. So he is risking his life. He needs to risk his life to reduce the genes on the Y chromosome. And when he does, instinct reduces and that's the package that he passes on to the female when he mates with her and the female the offspring of the female will then have uh, uh, offspring with less instinct and increased emotional attachment and that results in new life forms the reptiles follow the insects 
and the reptiles have less instinct and more emotional attachment than the insects. But just imagine that insects emerged 450 million years ago. He did not adapt to an environment. He is still as bright and he still stands out and he's still as vulnerable as he was then. This is how life presents. It cannot be any different. The male, because he carries the Y chromosome, must risk his life. He must do something to, to re induce the Y chromosome to shed its genes. But we will leave him in peace now because he has just commenced his life and we will just let him be. Maybe he will spread his wings before we go because he's beautiful iridescent green on top of his wings. We will just let him be and we are very fortunate or I am very fortunate to have had this opportunity. Unfortunately I was unable to capture female on camera. Evolution cannot be seen by only showing either the male or the female of a species. To see evolution, both the female and the male must be observed in order to see either their physical differences or their behavior. This is a pair of bird wing butterflies. And when you compare the bright green colored male to the black and white female, there is no argument that the male's colors are vibrant and stand out. Pay close attention to the colors of the female. They are not just black and white with a tinge of yellow at the bottom. The female's colors are dull as if faded, while the male's colors are bright and vibrant. That there is such a contrast in colors between the male and the female is not coincidence. Neither is the difference between the male vibrant colors and the dull colors of the female because it happened over thousands and thousands of years or because of the, there was a meteor strike or other environmental disaster. The difference between the colors of the male and the female is because the male must risk his life or run a greater risk to his life compared to the female. In herbivore insects, in this case the bird wing butterfly, the male does the risk-taking behavior through displaying brighter colors than the female. There is always something about the way the male looks or how he behaves that will pose a greater risk to his life compared to that of the female. And this is again obvious in the Ulysses butterfly. The colors of the male, who is on top of the slide, are much brighter compared to the colors of the female at the bottom of the slide. The colors of the female Ulysses butterfly look dull and faded in comparison to that of the male. The male Ulysses butterfly stands out in the environment. His brighter colors compared to that of the female means that he carries a greater risk of being noticed by predators. Therefore, there is a greater risk to his life compared to the female. And it is this risk-taking behavior by the male Ulysses that induces the Y chromosome that he carries to shed its genes. Again, nothing changed over 450 million years of evolution. The male Ulysses butterfly is still brighter than the female now as he was 450 million years ago. I have categorically said how evolution works. I have placed my neck on the chopping block, as it, as it were. Unlike Darwin, I do not have another idea to fill in a gaping big hole somewhere. Evolution is the reduction of instinct and the increase of emotional attachment, and this remains over the entire course of evolution. This process is of changing intelligence. Finally, the end product is the emergence of independent intelligence and self-awareness. With the arrival of humans, evolution has reached the lowest level of instinct. And from this low point, emotional attachment continuously increases. There are one million different insect species and I cannot possibly present them all. These four illustrations of the spider, the praying mantis and the two different butterfly species are good examples of the presentation of life and give insight into the evolution process. 
Besides the crucial interplay between the male and the female, there are enormous complex issues that automatically are set into play. Evolution is not survival. And this is obvious because the organisms best at surviving are single-celled organisms. Evolution continuously moves away from the high levels of instinct or inborn survival knowledge which is so obvious in single-celled organisms and also in the first animals, the insects. The first animals, the insects, have the highest level of instinct than any other animal. Not only have insects the highest level of instinct, they are, they are also the most diverse animals in the world and count one million different species to their ranks. The highest level of instinct translates into the highest level of innate survival knowledge. Therefore, insects are the best animal survivors. There are numerous facets that provide insight into, com into the complexity to the presentation of life and the development of independent intelligence and self-awareness. For instance, that the proliferation of life is at its highest point in the insects it's not coincidence. The reason why insects can reproduce in the tens, the hundreds or the thousands is because they reproduce with dominant instinct. Because insect, insects reproduce with dominant instinct, they do not have to teach their offspring how to survive. The offspring of insects know how to survive because they are born with dominant instinct or innate or inborn survival knowledge. The million different insect, insect species proliferate the environment with their offspring by reproducing in vast numbers. The insects form a biological food source for the animals following the insects. Following the insects are the reptiles. The reptiles have 9,500 species in diversity, which is an astounding 100 of diversity compared to the insects. An incredible reduction in species diversity. And the reason is that although the reptiles still produce with high levels of instinct, which is observed because they can lay eggs in the tens and the hundreds in number, their instinct has reduced and their emotional attachment has increased to the point that they protect their nest and their offspring. This process continued during the entire course of evolution and which results in less and less offspring. From an intelligence perspective, this makes really good sense. The entire process of evolution is to produce independent intelligence and self-awareness. That the process of evolution is ordered and specific is obvious. It is obvious when you try to change the order of, evolu of the evolution process. Just imagine that mammals were the first animals that emerged and that the insects were the second phase in evolution and finally humans arrived. This process would be impossible to develop because from the single-celled organisms of extreme egocentricity and instinct, evolution would then have to jump to the mammals of strong social behavior and an emotional attachment to offspring so strong that the parent is willing to sacrifice their life to protect her, their offspring. And then evolution would have to go back again to the insects and then return to reproducing with dominant instinct and offspring abandonment. And then after the insects then, evolution would have to jump again to the human phase of singular reproduction and to the lowest level of instinct and high emotional attachment and strong social behaviors. Evolution is not a chaotic process, rather it's ordered and sequential from dominant instinct to less instinct and to the highest level of emotional attachment. In the following video, I will present the animals in the intermediate phase. The reptiles, the birds, the monotremes, the marsupials, and I will touch on the mammals. Observing the bridge of transition which is formed by the animals in the intermediate phase ends any dispute in, on the process of evolution. In the next video I will put all the animals in the intermediate phase in a row up to the arrival of mammals. And observing the animals in the intermediate phase 
shows that evolution follows the trajectory of decreasing instinct and increasing emotional attachment.